And we're going to look tonight at the purpose of the sun, moon and stars, specifically um, at day four of creation. Um, but Danny, before we do that, maybe we can just quickly mention that obviously on day one, one of the first things God creates is a light source. Now, what, what do we know about that light, light source from the text? Nothing. <laughs> we just know that it's a light source. Uh, sometimes people, well, well, today we recognize the light source. Well, uh, let me back up a second. It says when he creates it on day three, he said, then separates, assuming on, on verse three, he then separates the light from the darkness and the light, and light, light he called day and the dark he called night. Um, and so obviously today the, the sun is that source of light during the daytime and it's missing, of course, at night. So many times people ask, critics will ask, skeptics will ask, well, what was the source of the light for the first three days? Well, that's a great question. They, they apparently think it's a gotcha question, but we have a very simple answer. We don't know what it was because scripture doesn't tell us. Now, some people speculate that that source was God himself. It says in the book of Revelation that uh, Jesus will be the light of the city, uh, the future city to be that we'll live in eternity uh, because there'll be no need of the, the sun and the moon. He'll be the light of the place. And people say, aha, this means that the light at the beginning was, was Jesus, or the creator. Well, I like that answer. That's, I think it's probably the right answer, but we don't know for sure that it is. Whatever, whatever the source was, though, I believe what happened on day four is that the Lord transferred that, that, uh, that function of providing light over to the sun. So, again, to be safe, we, shouldn't spec we can speculate, but we shouldn't be very dogmatic about what that source was. Yeah. And of course, you don't need the sun for, for for light, do you? You can as long as you have a light source there, and the Earth's on its rotation, it's it's possible to have a twenty four hour day without the sun being there. Yeah, you know, uh, you can buy uh, plant lights. These are special lights that you can put in light fixtures. that are, have a special uh, spectrum that, that's good for plants. It kind of mimics what the uh, what the solar spectrum looks like. It's not the most pleasing light for people to look at, but but it is a good light source. And, you know, um, it's getting more common for people to grow marijuana out in the open now because in the States, because it's being made legal in so many places. But uh, a number of years ago, it was quite illegal. And people would, would uh, outfit their basement with these complex irrigation systems and soil and plants with the plant lights that tape up all the windows you couldn't see in and there were there were many marijuana plants that uh, grew and uh, complete from from beginning to harvest that never saw the light of the sun <laughs> it was all artificial light so you're quite correct we don't need the sun we need a light source that's all we need yeah and so yeah. when we get to day four we see god create um lights to go in the expense of heaven, the greater light, the lesser light, the text tells us, and it says he also um, made the stars. And so I guess, first of all, you might wanna remind people about what the expense is. Okay, we, we talked uh, last time about uh, day uh, two of creation and now day four. To me, those are the two important parts about the astronomical side of creation. And uh, I, I believe the expanse is basically everything above us. Uh, to the to the ancient Hebrews, it would have been that way. They would have. It's called the heavens in verse eight. Uh, there in the day two account, and we use the word heaven in scripture does too, referring to things above us. Means lofty things. It can be the atmospheric heaven where clouds and birds are. It can and weather happen. It can refer to the astronomical heavens where the sun and the moon and the stars are, and it can refer to the abode of God. And uh, the fact that on day four, three times it says that God made uh, place these lights that he made on day four in the expanse of heaven. I think that's telling you with emphasis three times and putting those two together, expanse and heaven, that it's this thing he made on day two is where he put it. So in our modern parlance, what does that mean? Well, in our modern parlance, uh, the uh, expanse of heaven where the heavenly bodies are, we would call space. It's a modern terminology that would be foreign to ancient Hebrew. So to look at it in terms of our modern 21st century minds and English speaking world, I would say God made space on day two and probably the atmosphere as well. Yeah. And so before we look at the purpose of the sun, moon and stars, let's answer a few um, textual questions that often come up um, because some people say, well, the, the sun, moon and stars weren't created or made on day four, they just appeared because of their belief in you know, the Big Bang cosmology. 
Yeah, that's a that's a common belief. Uh, this idea probably started in the 19th century, certainly in the early 20th century, it became very popular because uh, men had developed this evolutionary theory of how, how planets evolve and how their atmospheres evolve. And the belief for quite a while was that the early Earth's atmosphere was very cloudy. They looked at Venus, they saw a cloudy atmosphere, they looked at Jupiter, they saw a cloudy atmosphere. And they, they termed these as being primitive atmospheres. And they thought the Earth went through a realm like uh, a time like that. But eventually it cleared. And so when people were trying to, uh, to make the, the scripture fit to man's ideas of billions of years with the gap theory or day age or whatever, they would, they would argue that on day four, all that God did was he made the uh, sky transparent for the first time. And so the sun, moon, and stars uh, were visible for the first time. And, and when it says there that God made these, they want to they wanna interpret that in what's called the pluperfect form, which is a, sort of a, a past a completed sense. The way you would do it in English today, you would say, and God had made, indicating mm-hmm. that past action. Um, but I, I've talked to uh, Hebraist people who know the text very well, and they say that's not really supportable at all by the reading there, any more than, than uh, verse, uh, verse 2 talks about the earth becoming uh, empty and unfilled. That's what they tried to argue with, uh, uh, with the, the gap theory. And um, it's pretty clear, I think, from the context, it doesn't refer to God making the, the heavenly bodies in the past. It, he made them on day four. Yeah. And of course, the word appear actually comes in, I think, on, on day three, where the, the dry land appears. And so yeah. the, the author doesn't use that word. But but another interesting thing is is actually the not named the, the sun, um, Shemesh or the moon, Yira. It's actually called the greater light and the lesser light. So why why did why did oh. God do that? Well, you know, this kind of comes into a wrong approach people have with the, the creation account of Genesis is too. I think the 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 important thing here is that the God is telling us that he's, he's not even bothering to use the common names for these things. He could have said, you know, God made the, the sun and the moon. He didn't even do that. He says he just made all these lights in the sky. And one of them he made kind of bright, he called the greater light and one a lesser light. And it's obviously he's talking about the sun and the moon. So you ask, well, why this one passage nowhere else in scripture does it term it that way? And it's because in many respects, uh, the creation account serves as a polemic against the surrounding cultures. They worship the sun and the moon and the stars as uh, as gods, but primarily the sun and the moon. And um, so some liberals pick up on this and say, aha, that's all the creation account is. And so we don't have to worry about the details. We can have millions of years. Don't have to worry about uh, actually an order of things because it's all merely a polemic saying that, that our God is greater than your God because he made these things. But just because the creation account in Genesis 1 is a polemic, it doesn't follow that it's only that and nothing else. Actually, the creation account serves multiple purposes. And it's actually a tremendous bit of literature. The, the people who can tear the Hebrew apart tell me that there's a lot of very complex structure going on. It is not a simple account at all. There's a lot going on that's kind of buried in the text there that doesn't translate well in many respects. And the uh, Hebraists are really impressed with the quality of the writing there. So, um, that's why I believe it's not mentioned uh, by name. They don't want the, God doesn't want to give any credence. These are merely creations. They're not gods at all. God made these, and so these are false gods that you're trying to worship here, and you should keep your, your attention and your worship upon the true creator, the, the one who made these things, not these things themselves. Yeah. And so well, let's go to the first object that God puts up, the sun or, or the mm-hmm. great light. Can you can you explain some of the design and, and the function and the purpose of the sun for us? Okay, well, several things are, are said there in the creation account for the uh, uh, the sun and the moon and stars. One was to um, uh, to to divide the, the the night from the day. And that gets down to the to the function again. I think it's transferred from the first three days of that light that's unspecified at the very beginning. Also, it says to provide light upon the earth, and the sun certainly does that. It was uh, raining earlier today here, but right now it's partly cloudy. The sun right now is shining through. Even if the, uh, I was out yesterday all day, I never saw the sun, but it was quite bright. I knew the sun was up there above those clouds, even coming through the rain just a little bit we had. And um, that is a function of providing light. I don't need to turn lights on the daytime for the most part. Most people don't, unless you're really indoors and got the windows shut. Uh, It's the sun is a perfect, 
perfect sort of light source for us to get around out there. Um, it also, we now know, provides uh, warmth on the Earth. This is going beyond the um, what the text tells us, but if without the sun, we would be in a, live in a very cold world. It, it's vital that we have, uh, have the sun. And um, that, that heat that's provided changes throughout the year from summer to winter. We have got a couple of reasons why that's going on. It's very complex. Again, scripture doesn't address that, but as a creation scientist, I recognize that in there. Um, also, you have, um, uh, let's see, you have the sun is a stable light source. I see design in it quite a bit. Uh, you know, many, many astronomers look for what we call solar analogs. These are stars that are like the sun. We would uh, specify that the sun is a G2 main sequence star. And that specifies its temperature and its size, and so it hints its brightness that it has. And we, we begin to think that um, a G2 main sequence star is, is a, an ideal star for living things. If you have more massive, brighter stars, that's not good. Dimmer stars aren't very good either. This seems to be the perfect star if you look at the details very, very carefully. But uh, what's interesting is when they look for solar analogs, they find out that most stars like the sun are variable. They vary by a few percent in brightness typically. Now with all the hand wringing over global uh, warming and climate change, can you imagine, Simon, if the, the sun varied by one or 2% over the course of say a year or so? I think of the pandemonium on the earth. The, the sun is amazingly stable. It has slight variations, but they're extremely small, and it makes it an outlier. We've now, for years, they were looking for a star like the sun, it was stable like the sun, and um, they finally found a few, but they are a very small minority. And so it's not even clear that the stars that we're seeing like the sun that are, that are stable, are they stable long-term or are they stable short-term? I mean, we've only been watching them for a few decades. It could be that a few hundred years ago, they were quite variable. So the sun is unusually stable and I see design in all of that again. Uh, there's one thing I've noticed about the sun that puzzles me, the lithium abundance on the sun is different. It's really out of range. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, nobody knows why. And I don't even know what purpose there is, but I'm going to go a little on a li out of limb here. I think that this this lithium abundance that the sun has, it's so uh, atypical of stars, may have some some design implication. We just haven't figured out what it is yet. You know, we we like design as creationists. Sometimes we're stumped. We don't know what the design is. It doesn't mean there's no design there. It merely means we haven't figured it out. Sort of like vestigial organs. At one time, they thought the many organs in the body were no longer necessary. We found that that all of them serve a purpose. Now, maybe you can get by with some of that without some of them, but but they all serve a purpose. And it's kind of foolish evolutionary nonsense to suggest that there was no design there. It's, it's not as old as cosmologists tell us it, it is. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear, catch that. Is there anything about the sun um, that? You know, sec secular cosmologists will tell us that it's billions of years old, but is there anything that limit limits it to, to fit with a young time frame? Yeah, well, for, for, first of all, I want to point out that uh, there actually is no evidence on the sun itself that tells us it's that old. Mm -hmm. It's just like there's not really a lot of evidence on the Earth that it's four and a half billion years old either. You know, the evidence for the for the four and a half billion year old age of the Earth and the sun and the rest of the solar system comes from what they call the most primitive uh, meteorites. It's that whole idea of how old the sun and the earth are comes down to a, an evolutionary model of how the solar system gradually formed out of a large cloud of dust, gas and dust. And so uh, a lot of the stuff got processed and moved around quite a bit like the earth did. So we don't find primordial rocks on the earth anymore. In fact, many meteorites went through processing. It's only the most primitive uh, meteorites that supposedly uh, date back to the very beginning and preserve relics of that beginning process for how the solar system formed. Now, right away, you may notice that there are scads of assumptions and evolutionary models built into that. If you start with an evolutionary assumption, you shouldn't be surprised then that your conclusions support that evolutionary assumption to begin with. And so there is no magic test you can do where you can just go get the data and the data is spit out, well, the, the Earth or the Sun are is X number of years old. You've got to do a lot of interpretation to start with, and then you've got to do a lot of interpretation to analyze the data. 
So they they base that upon radiometric radiometric materials found in the uh, in the rocks uh, of me very primitive meteorites. I first was encountered with this this question about the about the um, uh, age of the sun about 30 years ago. Somebody a creationist was challenging me on this, and for the first time, I really grasped the understanding that that we don't astronomically date the sun at all. Astronomy can't really tell us how old the sun is. All the astronomers can do is take the the argument or the idea that the sun is four and a half billion years old and fit it to uh, the rest of that. And that was quite a wake up call for me. And it had a profound influence upon me when, when that was pointed out to me. And I finally understood it for the first time. Now you ask uh, in, in conjunction with this, are there any uh, suggestions from the sun itself that maybe it's younger than generally thought? And I think there are some things. Uh, one thing I, I'm intrigued with is what we call the uh, faint, uh, faint, uh, young faint sun paradox. The, um, we believe that the sun is powered by thermonuclear reactions in its core. Uh, every second, about four tons of hydrogen is being uh, consumed as it's converted into helium and converted into energy. It's a nuclear power plant, as it were. And uh, we actually have evidence now that that's indeed happening, little neutrino particles. These are instinct particles we've detected now for oh, oh, going on a half a century that indicate that there are nuclear reactions going on in the sun, this kind we think are powering this thing. So there's some scientific evidence to back this up. Now, what's interesting is um, over thousands of years, or even a few million years, it doesn't really change much of anything, but you do this over several billion years and you build up an ash, as it were, a combustion product, not combustion, but byproducts of this nuclear reaction of helium in the nucleus at the expense of hydrogen. The sun is has a lifetime potential of about 10 billion years, so the sun has used up about half its possible fuel. And so there's quite a bit of buildup of um, helium uh, nuclei in the sun's core than much over the rest of the sun because it stays confined there. And this has a very subtle effect of changing uh, the composition change, of changing the conditions in the sun. Uh, for people more scientifically inclined, you're, re you're reducing, you're uh, uh, <clears throat> changing the mean molecular weight, which then if you understand gas laws and so forth, it causes the sun with fewer particles then to shrink and get hotter. And these nuclear reactions are very sensitive to temperature. And so if you increase the temperature just a little bit, you increase the output. And we can run the numbers on this pretty accurately. I've done some of these. And since the sun formed supposedly four and a half billion years ago, the sun is uh, now about 40% uh, brighter than it was back then. Since the appearance of life three and a half billion years ago, uh, according to evolutionary ideas, the sun is brightened by about 25%. Now, if you take those numbers and you, uh, apply them to the Earth's atmosphere and figure out, you know, how much is held in and, and, and reflected and so forth. You find out since life appeared on the Earth that the uh, Earth's temperature should have increased by about uh, 17 Celsius, give or take one Celsius or so. And um, that is when you realize that the Earth's average temperature of the day is 15 Celsius. That means that the Earth, on average, three and a half billion years ago, when life supposedly came out of the oceans, would have been minus two Celsius. Well, that's below freezing. Uh, that is the average temperature. And I, most of us understand that if that's the case, then you don't have life emerging out of this liquid ocean. You've got an ice ball planet that probably never, never melts because it just reflects all the sunlight away. Nobody believes that happened. So this is called the faint young, young sun paradox. How in the world was the sun faint all this time when, um, uh, when it was fainter? How, how did life exist and how did it come about? Because you see, most scientists think that the earth has always been uh, about the same temperature it is today. Well, there have been many attempts to try to explain this. Most of them zero in on uh, greenhouse gases being much more abundant in the early atmosphere. And as time went by, the, uh, the atmosphere did evolve to the point that, uh, that the uh, uh, that the greenhouse gases were eliminated and you kept a steady balance there for you know, billions of years. But these are two totally unrelated mechanisms with no feedback between them. And you're supposed to believe it went on for three and a half billion years. That's remarkable that you can actually believe that would happen. So I, I think that's very strong evidence that the sun is not nearly as old as people think. It doesn't automatically mean it's thousands of years old. It does mean, though, that it can't be billions of years, I don't believe. So that's one argument I think the sun 
provides for us for a, a recent origin. Yeah, and there's, a, there's another passage in scripture that um, skeptics, I guess, like to go to when it, what, you know, concern in the sun, that's um, Joshua 10 and, and Joshua's long day, when, uh, God makes the sun stand, stand still. So, ha, you know, can you explain that a bit from, from an, an, an astronomer perspective? Well, there's not much as we, 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 we know from the text. It's only mentioned there in a couple of verses in Joshua 10. Uh, the setup was that uh, they were having this battle at, at, at Gibeon, and uh, uh, they had to, uh, they actually had marched o- overnight, as it turns out, to get there. The battle's raging. It's getting up in the middle of the day, and it looked like the battle was going to go for, for quite a while, and uh, they, were, they needed the victory, but how are you going to assure that? So, and in fact, uh, it says that they chased them for some distance. Like, and if you look on the maps, it's like 20, 30 miles they chased these people. And this is a bit of a problem if you're fighting and chasing people. How can you get all this work done without calling it quits at the end of the day and picking up the next day? Well, God inter- God intervened. Joshua asked the Lord's help on this. And uh, we don't know exactly how the events came across. If God told him to do this, he took it upon himself, whatever. But God said, you know, jo- jo- Joshua said, you know, stand still, sun over Gibeon and uh, the moon over the um, – uh, the Valley of Aljuan. And then if you look off to in the map, it's off to the west. And if it, if, if so, the, I think the moon was probably low in the sky, probably a, a third quarter moon, I'm going to guess. And the time was probably the middle of the day because it was over at top of Gideon, it said. So um, and if you would have been on the battlefield, you would have noticed that the sun stopped in the sky. Every day we know it rises over here in the east, moves across the sky and sets in the west. And so the sun stopped in the heavens like this, in the midst of heaven. And the moon did too, it's over here, and it's not going anywhere either. So uh, uh, people might want to say, well, see, it says right there that the, that the sun stopped, and the sun can't stop if the sun is m- not moving. So they try to argue this teaches geocentrism, that the earth is not moving, it's not even spinning, it's the sun that's doing the moving. By the way, there are skeptics who have said that for some time. There are some Christians who argue that. They want to argue that the Bible teaches this. Well, you know, there's there's no problem here. Uh, I, every every day I, I, I know that the sun rises in the east and I know it moves across the sky. I can look out my window and I can see it moving across here. And in a very real sense, it is moving in the sky. Motion's a very tricky thing. Everybody seems to think that we can we can measure absolute motion. That's nonsense. The only motion we can measure is relative motion. Now, from my perspective, I, I see the sun moving, and that's indeed what it's doing. Now, that doesn't preclude, and I believe that's true. It doesn't preclude, though, that it's the Earth's rotation that's causing that. So given that, I believe what happened at the time is, is God intervened and stopped the Earth's rotation. And it, it's not doing any damage to the text at all because in a very real sense, as I said, the sun does move, and the sun did stop in the sky. Only people who want to take a very pedantic, wooden approach to Scripture that they would never apply anywhere else would you conclude that this is teaching geocentrism of any type. Yeah. Um, We've had had two questions come in regarding the sun. Can you take those now? Sure. Uh, So someone's asked, do you think the sun was closer before Adam sinned? No, I don't think there was ever actually much of a change in the sun's distance or the Earth's distance from the sun. I think it's been about the same all along. Yeah, so no change in the distance. And then the, the second question is, um, once in a while I hear the, the term sunspots. Can you explain exactly what that is and do sunspots have effects on climate weather? <clears throat> oh, well, I love that question. You know, here at the museum we do a program in the summer uh, called sunspotting. We um, uh, sunspots are, are we, we get to look at these things through the telescope. Uh, sunspots are darker regions on the sun. They look like little blemishes, the little black dots. I've taken some photographs of these myself, and um, they're they're um, interesting things. Um, they are cooler regions on the sun. The temperature of the sun uh, is about 6,700 Kelvin. And the that's uh, about 7,000 Celsius, I guess, or 60, went the wrong way, 6,500 Celsius. And sunspots are about 1,000 Kelvin cooler than that. So around 5,000 Kelvin or so, about 5,500 Kelvin perhaps. And the um, 
Uh, that's the, so they actually are quite bright. It's just by com contrast to the rest of the sun, they look bright. If you use a so special kind of filter, and you, it's very important, I want to emphasize, never try looking at the sun unless you have safe filters and you know how to use them. I don't suggest that amateurs try this because it's very dangerous looking at the sun. But I've, I've used safe filters many times. And um, when I put that on the on the telescope and look at it, the, the uh, photosphere, the bright part of the sun looks bright, but the sunspots look dark. But if you were to cover up all the sun except for the sunspots, they would be so bright they would blind you. It's just they look darker by contrast. And they, um, there are strong magnetic fields in the sun. Uh, sunspots generally occur in pairs or in groups dominated by a pair. And we have a way uh, using a thing called the, um, oh boy, I, I just can't remember the term off the top of my head. Uh, we have splitting of, of spectral lines. And oh, over 100 years ago, people, uh, astronomers learned that the Zeeman splitting, it's called Zeeman splitting, that's the name. And um, they discovered that the splitting occurs in these, in these things, in these sunspots, the light of the sunspots. So we know that they're in intense magnetic fields. And we even know the polarity is reversed. And one's a north and one's a south. And in one hemisphere of the sun, one the, the leading one as the sun rotates once a month will be one polarity and the trailing one will be the opposite polarity and those reversed in the other hemisphere. Interesting how that works. And sunspots don't occur every day. They occur in a, in a cycle of about 11 years where you'll have a, a few years of a lot of spots and a few years of very few spots. Right now we're in a sunspot minimum, a very profound one, by the way. So you can go for weeks or months without seeing any spots. The last year or so, we've had very few spots in the sun. We didn't really do sunspotting much last summer because of that. It was pretty boring. We'll start swinging upward another year or so. Now, the next maximum is expected to be around 2025. We expect a lot of spots as we approach that. But for the next year or so, don't expect too many. Now, what's interesting is that the amount of sunspots uh, also can vary over a much longer cycle. If you plot the number of sunspots, and people have been doing that for about 250 years, your, your plot will look like this. The spots go up and then they go down. Number of spots go up and down, up and down, and it goes like this in this plot up and down. But uh, over decades and over centuries, the numbers actually go down and they go up again. And people have noticed from historical records and from uh, some stand-ins, some proxies we have of sunspot activity in the past, they've, they've been the correspondence between a lot of sunspot activity and warm weather and little sunspot activity and cooler weather. There was a period of time a thousand years ago, it was very, very warm in, in northern, northern uh, uh, new, new North America and in Europe, you know, the Vikings were pillaging at that time because they had a population explosion. And uh, that corresponded to a time of several centuries where there was a lot of sunspot activity. Mm -hmm. And then there was a little ice age about uh, 400 years ago where there were very few sunspots and for about 75 years. And you had glacial advance uh, going on in Alp Alpine countries. So. There is a correlation, uh, but correlation does not necessarily uh, imply causation. So that's a big debate still going on. I happen to think that sunspot cycle, uh, some, some sunspot cycles affect climate like that, but uh, I have the clue what the mechanism is, and nobody nobody knows. Um, again, causation does not necessarily mean that. I mean, uh, correlation does not necessarily mean causation. So we need to be careful on that, how we interpret that. Yeah. Um, we've got another question I can see there's a good number of people watching tonight from different countries which is really good we've got people from India watching Northern Ireland um, obviously the US some people from the US from Chile um, Portugal and we do have a question from our friend from last week from Portugal and he's asked Danny if God made Adam perfect using his senses and his senses could lead him to see that the Sun and the moon are in this in are uh, sorry are the same in size matters what would adam or any of the dis descendants would think that there is an enormous difference of size as it is said today well the, uh, the sun and the moon are about the same size in the sky they're about a half degree uh the 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 the, the uh sun varies by about three percent in its diameter throughout the year because we have an elliptical orbit so it means we're closer, a little, about 3% closer sometimes than we are at others. And uh, the moon varies by about uh, 13, 14%. I took up some photos, pairs of photos last year of the full moon taken um, when it was near the sun. The moon was closest to us and farther away. And you, you put them side by side and you can see the difference. It's, it's rather, rather stark. 
Uh, the eye can't really perceive that because you, you, you really can't compare things that happened six or seven months ago to what you're seeing now. You have to have a good side-by-side -side comparison for the eye to see that. But um, I think even, even ancient man, I think Adam too, would have noted, realized that uh, the parent size depends on two things. It depends on how large something is, actually, and how far away it is. And if you have reason to believe that the sun and the moon are the same distance, then they are going to appear the same size. If they, are, if they appear the same size, then they must be the same size. But there's nothing in Scripture requires either one of those. There's nothing in Scripture that says that even addresses the size of the sun and the moon, their angular size, how big they look or how big they actually are, or the distances. None of that's given to us. So I think it's quite within the purview of man to study these things and reach a few conclusions. And it took a while, but uh, people eventually figured out that the sun was indeed farther away uh, than, than the moon is. Uh, there were some ancient Greek astronomers, uh, like 3rd century BC, who figured that out. They worked out a scale. It wasn't a very good one, but uh, I think it was Aristarchus of Samos uh, was one who realized uh, that the Earth was larger than the moon, and he realized that the sun was larger than either one of them. And to him, it made sense that, that the Earth would move around the sun each year and the moon would move around the Earth each year. It just made sense to do that. But getting the scales right took a long time. The size of the Earth was determined in 200 BC. The um, uh, sort of the scale of the solar system was worked out 500 years ago in terms of the Earth being a scale, but we didn't know how how big the Earth's distance from the Sun was. That really wasn't determined well until um, oh, around 1800 and thereabouts. They were getting pretty good measurements of that then. The Moon's distance was measured by Tycho Brahe by, before uh, 1600, and he knew the distance very accurately on that one. So uh, if you have some good devices, some optical aid, those kind of things, then it's quite possible to, to deduce these things. We don't know if Adam ever did that or not. But again, um, just because two objects look the same size, it doesn't mean they are the same size. There's one other quantity you have to throw in there, the distance, in order to figure out exactly how big these things are. Mm -hmm. Great. So hopefully that um, helps with the question. <clears throat> But let's turn our attention to, to the moon, the lesser lights. Um, I, I think I've heard it being described as a beautiful desolation. Um, so the, the moon is an, is an amazing object. What can you tell us, Danny, about um, the purpose and, and design of the moon? Yeah, that beautiful desolation came from one of the Apollo astronauts. They, uh, they were... Okay. They orbited the moon, they, they looked at it, and they were mesmerized. It, it, it looked you know, startling beautifully to them up close. No one ever seen it that way. So they were, they were, they were fascinated with it. But at the same time, it, it didn't look anything like Earth. It looked you know, totally dead, which it is. That's why they, they said it that way about these things. But the, uh, the moon has a number of important functions. It does provide light at night. If you go out during a full moon, you can see quite well. Uh, I think I may have mentioned to you last time, I've mentioned to someone recently, I've done this experiment a few times at night. Um, you got to be careful doing this, but I've traveled along at night on a lonely country road with a full moon, no traffic around, and I've turned the headlights off in the car a few times. And I could drive on a road that doesn't have any trees over top, really, because that will shade things. I can see well enough to drive a car at night in the full moon. Now, I don't recommend you do this much. I'd only do it for you know five or 10 seconds at a time because you never know that some fool like you could be coming the other way with their headlights off and you may not see them. There's a reason why we have headlights at night, but you actually could drive around, particularly if you're doing it at a low speed. Certainly, I've walked around at night in full moon, no problem. So the, the moon provides light when it's out. It's only out uh, part of the time at night and, and really bright enough to do that only a few days a month, really but it's a good light source for that. But, uh, you know, it says there in the, in the Genesis account that uh, toward one of the purposes there is to be for, uh, for days and for years. Now, the day is the daily cycle of night and day. Today, we would describe that as being due to the Earth's rotation where the sun's up, the sun's down, and so forth. And the year is the annual motion. We would describe that as the revolution of the Earth around the sun, along with the tilt, giving us the climatic seasons of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Um, it's interesting that those are our basis today. We talk about today. We talk about tomorrow. We have dates. We subdivide the, the day into hours and minutes and so forth. But we have this natural time unit, the day. 
we also have a natural time unit, the year. This is the year 2020. We do things on an annual cycle. We pay our taxes on a certain day. We go to school uh, for a certain time of the year. We finish up a school year, even though that year is not really a year long. It, it's on an annual cycle. And that's another natural cycle we have. We have uh, this, this year that we, is defined by also what's going on in the sky with regards to the sun. But then there's an intermediate sort of measurement that's natural too. We have the, the day and the year, but they're kind of long and short. I need something in between. The thing in between is what we call the month. And the word month comes from the word for moon, month, moon. It comes from that, that word, Anglo-Saxon word for, for month. And the month originally was the rate at which the, uh, the period of which the moon orbited the earth and, and goes to its lunar cycles. There are several ways we can find the, the month, but the best way is what we call the synodic month. It's the orbital period of the moon with respect to the sun. And since the Earth, the sun, moon's phases are due to how much of the lit half of the moon we see, the, um, the, the phases of the moon recur on that, repeat on that, that uh, uh, 29 and a half day cycle. And so uh, most ancient calendars began at least as what we call a lunar calendar, the 29 and a half days. And that meant that one month was 29 days, the next month was 30, usually alternating back and forth between those two. And if you do that, you end up with a year, it's about 12 months, which is about 355 days, about 10 days short of being a full year. Well, how do you handle that mismatch at that point? And uh, different ways of doing that. The ancient Hebrews had a very common practice throughout the ancient world. What you would do is uh, you would just start the next year about 10 days early. And the next year, you'd be 10 days off, now 20 days off, and you start the next year about 20 days early. And then that third year, you're off by one month. So every third year or so, on average, uh, you would insert a, what we call an intercalary month, a 13th month, and that would get you back in sync. And this is the kind of calendar that the ancient Hebrews followed. We call that a uh, lunar solar calendar. It's lunar, but not strictly lunar. You, uh, you get in sync with the sun once again. That's in contrast with the Islamic calendar, which is strictly a lunar calendar. The month of Ramadan occurs 10 days earlier every year on our calendar. But uh, if you use, uh, if you insert that in a calorie month that the Arabs don't, or the Muslims don't use, then uh, you get it back in sync. And the first month of the Hebrew calendar is Abib. And it actually refers to the budding of the, uh, of the barley harvest. There in the Mediterranean climate, they would sow barley in the autumn. The, uh, the uh, winter rains would nourish that, it would grow. And then it would start to ripen up in the spring. And they would know whether to insert an inner calorie month if the barley was, was uh, which is the first grain, the wheat and stuff would take longer, barley would, would ripen first. And so they, they, would, they would bring uh, barley sheaves into the, into the priest there in Jerusalem and they'll ask them, okay, is this thing gonna be ready? Because they needed to do this first fruits sacrifice the time of the, of the Passover there in the spring. And uh, if it wasn't quite ready, then they put the inner calorie month in. If it were, were ready, then they would go ahead and, and uh, not put an inner calorie month. And that kept it back in sync with the seasons. Uh, and that uh, word of Beeb has a, again, has a, has a, is related to a term talking about the ripening of, of that grain crop. Now, eventually, the, uh, particularly after the temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago, the, um, the Jews uh, adopted a thing called the metonic cycle. It's a way to mechanically put in uh, uh, the right number of months in a 19-year cycle to keep it in sync with what's going on astronomically and with the seasons. And that's what's been done by them ever since. And different cultures discovered this cycle independently of each other. It's a pretty common, well, if you do this long enough, you'll, you'll pick it up and figure out you know, how to do this. But uh, it was based upon the grain there. And this brings up you know, some of the other purposes there. It, uh, the, the reason why I don't think the month is mentioned is it's because it kind of implied there, but also the the month was uh, tied to the moon, which was a which was a god or a goddess to those polytheistic societies. And again, God didn't want even want to mention it because our name for the month is our name comes means the moon, and the same thing is true in Hebrew. If you're going to mention the month there, you're going to mention a pagan deity's name. Can't get a lot of it. So. So uh, God very cleverly just didn't even mention the month. He said seasons. Now, most of us, you know, it says for, si for si seasons and days and, and years. Now, most of us, when we hear the word season, I'm for years I thought, you know, well, spring, summer, uh, winter, and autumn. 
climatic season, but it turns out that's not the only use of the word season, in, even in English. Uh, right now, we're, we're with COVID-19, we've postponed the start of baseball season, all right? Now people are worried about the uh, this fall, is it still going on? Are we going to have American football season? The basketball season has been all fouled up because uh, this should be ending in playoffs pretty soon here. Their season was suspended. We have all sorts of sports seasons. I'm sure it's the same thing in the UK. We also have hunting seasons. We have deer season, turkey season, squirrel season, rabbit season, all those th kind of things. And so uh, uh, when you when you have uh, those seasons, what it is, is it's a, it's a time, a pointed time for some purpose. And the Hebrew word used there for translated season into English is moed. And that is the word that's used for the festivals. They had three big ones given to them. You had the Passover and you had Pentecost and you had uh, then the, uh, the uh, Sukkot, the, the uh, Sukkot, the, the, um, the Feast of Tabernacles and uh, late summer, early autumn, actually. And uh, these are all tied to the to the phase of the moon. The first uh, Passover occurred in Egypt. It happened around the time of the vernal equinox. There was a full moon at that time, and so when God instituted, He said, "This will be a this will be a remembrance for you. It will be a moed for you uh, every year uh, on this on the fifteenth day of this month, and the uh, this month of Abib, which is that first month uh, starting there in the in the spring uh, near the vernal equinox." Up to that point, the civil calendar was in six months later, around the time of the autumnal equinox. There's a reason why they did that. We can talk about that later if you want. And the uh, so this became the civil, so the, the religious calendar there. And the uh, the first of the month was when the uh, I believe when the priest could glimpse the first little bit of the crescent moon. But that's day one because remember their day starts at sundown. So within a few minutes, you'll know if it is the first month of the new month, the first day of the new month, or the last day of the previous month. And then you would uh, run forward uh, 14 days to the 15th day, and the moon would be full. And so the Passover always falls on a full moon. On our calendar, the, the moons bounce around because Julius Caesar in the 45 BC scrapped the Roman lunar calendar in favor of a, of a solar calendar. And they had to do that by padding the months by adding 10 days. That's why our months are typically uh, 30 and 31 rather than 29 and 30 days. So the, um, uh, but the, the Passover feast and the other feasts tied to the calendar are always uh, and have been dedicated or, or, or decided by the phase of the moon. And that's one of the purposes given there. And I didn't know that for a long time. When I finally learned that, I thought, well, that's, that's deeper than I ever could have imagined. Uh, very interesting thing is um, when the people have um, Egypt at the Exodus in, in Exodus 12, we, we read that it took place at night. Now you might think that's a strange time to bring the people out of Egypt at a night time, but that was actually during a full moon, right? Yeah, that's God's providence. You know, you'll watch the movie The Ten Commandments. They all left in the middle of the day, but that's not what it had said. It said they, they tell. Pharaoh told them to get up and get out of here. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, what they were told to do that first Passover was to put the, uh, to, to take the lamb, just slaughter, put the, put the, uh, the blood on the doorpost and the, and the lentil with the, uh, with the, uh, with the hyssop branch and then uh, roast the thing to eat. Uh, don't worry about making 11 bread when there's not enough time. You don't have time. It's going to be in haste and do it with your bags packed and your shoes on your feet. And when the when the word came, they got out of there that night, and that would have that's again providential. As I said before, you can actually get around pretty well at night with with a full moon, and so this uh, full moon provided them light to actually travel that first night of the Passover. And people observe that uh, ever since. Even today, I understand Jews are supposed to observe the Passover with shoes on their feet you know, because uh, you're not relaxing at home. Supposedly, it's a memorial to the first Passover 3,500 years ago that. Uh, you needed to be ready to, ready to go. And so it truly is a memorial of, of, of what happened that first Passover night. Yeah. One of the things you can see um, from Earth when you look at the moon is the um, craters, that the, the fact that it's, had, it's been impacted by something before. How do you typically answer that, the, 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 the craters on the moon? Yeah, that's uh, one of the features that... Uh, when you look at the moon through a telescope for the first time, you see those those craters, and uh, it's it's pretty impressive. 
and it looks like a battle scene. It looks pretty pockmarked. And there was a debate that raged uh, ever since the, uh, the mention of the telescope 400 years ago, what caused these craters. Some people thought that things hit upon the surface of the moon and blasted out the craters. Other people thought, no, these are volcanic uh, things. There are volcanic craters, calderas and fumaroles and things like this. And it really wasn't until the 19th century that people began to take the uh, impact theory more seriously. And it wasn't, it wasn't well established until well into the 20th century, believe it or not. And uh, I think there's abundant evidence that, that, that most, not all, but most craters in the moon were formed by impacts. So a question occurs, well, when did those impacts occur? Well, if you believe in billions of years, you stretch it out over four and a half billion years. But if you, and, and the things that hit the moon would have been some of those leftover pieces that never got amalgamated into the planets and the moon and so forth. And there are some of them still out there, but not many. Now, if you're a creationist, uh, first of all, we don't believe that's how the solar system formed. Second of all, we don't believe it formed over billions of years. It happened in one day on day four. And so uh, what are all these craters? What are they there for? And uh, there have been a debate going on for a couple of decades among uh, creation scientists. I've been part of that debate, by the way. And the, uh, the, the, the first time out, people were thinking, well, maybe these things are result of some sort of judgment. Maybe, uh, maybe the, the moon got pounded at the time of, um, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the fall, or maybe at the time of the flood, the, uh, the, the earth was being hit and the, and the moon was being hit too. Many different places people tried to place these things. Some people will put it with the rebellion of Satan. We've, one passage in scripture talks about the uh, war in heaven between Michael and the angels and so forth. Um, I don't want to go into that one at all, but uh, I came to the conclusion about 20 years ago that um, I can see two episodes of cratering on the moon. We have normal cratering, and then we have these really big ones that happened last, and they formed these very large craters that filled with lava to form what we call the Mari on the moon. If you, if you look at the full moon with the naked eye, you can see these light and dark areas on the moon, and they give the appearance of the man in the moon to, to a lot of people. And the... Um, I believe what happened was uh, that large impact, those probably occurred about the time of the flood. Uh, I believe there, we believe there's probably some impacts on the, on, the, on the earth during the flood because we find fossil craters in the, uh, in the uh, sedimentary rocks around the world. And so it suggests where the earth was being uh, pummeled at that time when those sedimentary layers were being laid around uh, down during the time of the flood. And so the, the moon perhaps was collateral damage as for the other craters that were um, older than that, uh, I believe that they, they date from the time of, of formation uh, on day four. You know, uh, the last time we spoke, I, I talked about the fact that uh, many creationists think that everything in the creation week was miraculous and it was ex nihilo, out of nothing and instantly. But uh, as I look at the creation count in detail, I see a lot of process going on. Not long, drawn out, random processes, but directed short duration processes, but still processes. So I think that God assembled the moon from pieces on day four. There was a matter he made earlier in the week. I don't know. Was it matter he made on that day? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But I think he did some assembly. And when he got done, he ended up with, uh, with the last few pieces coming in, leaving these impacts behind. Many people want to think that uh, impacts on a sterile world somehow is not very good and doesn't fit in with the very good that God declared at the end of the creation week. I disagree. What's what's bad about an impact on a sterile world? It's not going to kill anything or anyone. So I don't see why there's a problem here. And it does make for an interesting surface. Uh, you know, some people want to want to make that very good uh, to be perfect, and then they, which is not what you ought to do, and then they want to be the arbiters of what's perfect and what's not. And I've seen some mighty strange ideas that some creationists have put forth along those fronts. And if you if you really think that about the moon, then you end up with something that's going to be perfectly smooth and round like a like a billiard ball or a cue ball. And I don't think that's the way it was. I think God made some variety on the surface. And I have no problem with a lot of those craters being primordial from the day four creation of the moon. Yeah. I mean, I mean when you just look beautiful anyway. Yeah, the, the moon is a, is a beautiful object. I enjoy showing it to people. Uh, you know, we have stargazer nights here at our planet, our observatory at the uh, Creation Museum, and, and I get a kick out of watching people's reaction because many of the people who come to this have never looked through a telescope. And so I use the best telescope I think we have for looking at the moon, and it gives very sh sharp, clear images of the moon, and people are blown away. They're just, they can't believe what they're looking at. And... Uh, 
then I try to teach them a little bit about the history of the moon, looking at the different kinds of craters and, and, and what's going on. There are different colors and things. But uh, I let people just look at it for a while and drink it in. Yeah. yeah. But what about um, the, the purpose of the stars on day four? The purpose of the stars? Yeah. Now, they, they provide the backdrop for all these things. Uh, we see the uh, moon, uh, well, the whole sky spins around each day, we think, due to the Earth's rotation. So it carries the sun, the moon, and planets, and the stars with it. But um, if you watch very carefully, the moon moves from west to east uh, each uh, each night, uh, from one night to the next. Well, right now, the moon is about third quarter, which means it will be back in the evening sky in another week and a half. So another week and a half, I, I challenge people, go out each night and look at it, look for it over in the northwest. It'll be a thin crescent, and then each night it will go from west to east across the sky. Now, as you stand looking towards the south, north will be up, south will be down, west will be to your right, and east will be to your left. That's the reversed of uh, what you see on a map, because on a map you're looking down onto the earth, but when you're looking at the sky, you're looking up, so the, the directions get reversed. So in the northern hemisphere, at least, the, uh, the moon will start as a thin crescent over the northwest in a week and a half, and each night it will go farther to right to left, that is west to east. And if you make a note, same time to look at it each night. You know what, what night you see it, write down the time, notice its position. And you come back tomorrow night, it will be at the same time farther to the left, about 13 degrees. That's the, uh, that's the moon's orbital motion. And if there are any bright stars next to it, you can see that motion. The other morning I was out and I saw uh, the third quarter moon near Jupiter and Saturn. And I uh, didn't see it the next morning because it was cloudy, but I know that it moved across the sky because that's what it does all the time. And the uh, sun also moves with respect to the stars. Uh, that's as due to our orbital motion around the sun once a year. And that causes the stars we see at night to change. Right now, we're transitioning now from stars of spring to stars of summer. The stars of winter are gone. The stars of spring are disappearing. And in a few months, three months, those stars of summer will start disappearing, start being replaced by the stars of autumn. And so the stars are that backdrop that allow us to see these things. And these stars then fit in with some of those purposes that we, we've already described a little bit there. They, they, in conjunction with the sun and the moon, allow us to, uh, uh, to, to let the sun and the moon do their purposes, I think. And Cocard would cover more than stars, wouldn't it? It would, it would encompass um, planets. So there's something there about, you know, God not just creating the stars, but he creates the planets as well. Yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the Hebrew word kokob, uh, just like the Greek word aster, refers to any, uh, any sort of bright light in the sky. They, they, it's a question of whether they, they made a distinction between the sun and the moon. I think generally they did, but everything else you saw in the sky, that was a star. And this idea of, uh, of making a distinction from the stars today, redefining it, is a modern concept. The, um, the Greeks called the planets, they called them um, planetes esteros, which means wandering stars, because the, the five naked eye planets look like bright stars. That's what they look like, so I call them stars. And I've taken some photographs and put them up on my Facebook page uh, as they were doing things, and I said, well, this star on the right, the bright one's Jupiter, one on the left is Saturn. People would write in, like, would comment and say, what do you mean there's stars? I thought there were planets. i say, that's fine. That's what they look like, so therefore they're stars. Um, but, you know, in the ancient times, they called them wandering planet, wandering stars. We get the word planet from that Greek term uh, for that. And um, uh, it really was not until about 400 years ago with the acceptance of the heliocentric model, the idea that the Earth is one of several other objects, planets as it were, orbiting around the sun, that we then redefine what the planets were. Up to that point, it was just a wandering star. Now a planet means something different. Now also in the sky, they had seen little fuzzy patches of light in the sky. When the telescope was invented 400 years ago, they saw some of these things were indeed clusters of stars. Others were little fuzzy patches, which they called nebulae, which means cloud. It's a Latin word for that. And uh, we get some words from that meaning cloudy. And later on, we found out some of those truly are clouds of gas, but others are actually distant collections of galaxies, stars. To the ancient world, all of these would have been stars. And even today, we sometimes refer to, say, Venus. It's the evening star right now. We talk about uh, shooting stars or falling stars. But uh, today we call them meteors. But all of these distinctions, all these new terms are just that. They're new terms. And they're totally foreign to more than 400 years ago. 
So uh, when when on day four it says he made the stars also, it's not talking about just the stars as we define them today. It's also talking about nebulae, galaxies. It's talking about the planets as well. So in modern parlance, it'd be best to say, and he made the astronomical other astronomical bodies also. That would get it across more clearly to the modern mind because we want to impose our modern definition of star upon the ancient text, and that's wrong. We shouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> questions come through and just to remind people if you want to ask Dr. Faulkner a question then please do type it into the comment section and we'll try and get to them um, but <clears> someone <throat> asked regarding the moon do we know that elements the moon could be made out of uh, yeah well one thing we have um, the rock samples brought back from the Apollo astronauts they were they were studied well not the, a lot of them we haven't been studied yet but we we saved some of them back but they did some extensive studies on some of the rocks to find the elemental compositions and they kind of knew that before because you can take the uh, reflectivity of the uh, lunar surface it has uh, the colors it gives off tells you something about what it's made out of that's standard analysis by the way you can do that uh, the spectral analysis of light can tell you what things are made out of. You don't need to do a chemical a test. You can you can do spectral analysis as well. So we had some clues. It's better to do the chemical analysis, however. And they had some clues about what the uh, what the moon was made of before we went there. But when we came back, we confirmed it and got into more detail. And what we find is it's uh, made out of rock, <laughs> well, more specifically uh, silicate rock. Silicon uh, silicate rock consists of uh, the four silicon uh, molecules and oxygen put together and then it's bonded to a metal on the uh, it can be aluminum it can be magnesium it can be iron so you have iron silicate aluminum silicate and so forth and um, we have similar type rocks on the earth and then we could break break it down from there we find out that these silicates are a little different than on the earth we find the isotopic abundance is a little different isotopes are the same element but having different number of neutrons in the nucleus and so we find that there are some similarities but yet differences between subtle that they are between the chemical abundance of the two, uh, the Earth and the Moon. The big thing, the big difference, is the fact that the uh, the Moon is missing most of the heavier elements. Uh, the Earth has a lot of iron and nickel, mostly in its core, but some on the surface. But uh, the Moon is pretty void of that. There's not a lot of iron and nickel in the Moon anywhere, and uh, that's a that's a just, you know, interesting result. We kind of knew that beforehand from the density of the Moon. It's only 3.3 grams per cubic centimeter, as opposed to five and a half for the Earth. And that told us even before we went there that iron and nickel were pretty pretty sparse on the moon. We'd find very little on the surface, and the interior has to have very little too. Otherwise, the moon's density would be greater. So, yeah, we have several lines of evidence we can use to figure out what the moon's made out of. And besides just the lab analysis, we now can do. Yes. Uh, someone said, someone's watching. Um, but we've got another question about the stars, Danny. Isn't the North Star in the same place all the time? Is the North Star in the same place all the time? Uh, sort of, but no. Uh, the North Star lies within three quarters of a degree of the North Celestial Pole. So if I, uh, that, the North Celestial Pole is this direction in space that the Earth's rotation axis is pointing at. So as the Earth spins around each day and each night, the whole sky seems to spin around this point in the sky we call the North Celestial Pole. And I've done a number of photographs, done some time lapse of this. I'll set my camera up in a dark location and you'll see the stars here. If I take a bunch of pictures and put them in a time lapse, and I've done that over like two hours, you'll see the stars spinning, spinning around the sky like this. And at the middle, there is a single star. That's the North Star, Polaris, and it doesn't seem to move. However, it is. It's just its motion is radius is less than a degree. So on most of these photographs, it doesn't look like any motion at all. And indeed, to the eye, it looks motionless. If I go out tonight and look at the North Star, uh, it looks about the same as it always does, no matter which time of night I go. However, if I set up a telescope and point it at it and get it centered, and I come back out about three hours later, it won't be centered anymore. It's going in a small circle in the sky. Now, there's also something else going on. The Earth's rotation axis is not pointing in the same direction all the time. Uh, there's an effect called precession. It was discovered uh, 2,200 years ago by a guy named Hipparchus. He didn't know what was causing it. Nobody knew really until after Newton a few hundred years ago. But the, um, the effect of the sun primarily causes the rotation axis of the Earth to slowly go like this in a big conical sort of shape. 
It's a big, big arc, arc like this. And um, the North Star right now happens to be very close to that point in the sky, but it started getting close to that in the late, in the Middle Ages. Uh, as it turns out, 2,000 years ago, there was no bright pole star. The North Star was far enough away from that uh, not to be uh, considered a pole star. If you take the conventional date of the construction of the pyramids in Egypt, uh, a bright star in the constellation Draco called Thuban was the pole star. In another 12,000 years or so, the uh, one of the brightest stars in the sky, Vega, will be the pole star, and that will be really a, a good pole star. So, you know, I've given you two different answers here. It's not exactly uh, at, at the center of everything, uh, the motion, but it's close enough to your eyes. But over thousands of years, it does vary quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. I hope, I hope that helps. Let's just go back to the stars because you read that they are the uh, sign and seasons, not just the star, but the sun and the moon. And people often ask about, well, you know, in, in the New Testament with the coming of Christ, um, we have the star of Bethlehem. What, what do you think the star of Bethlehem, Bethlehem was? Okay, there are several ways we can take the, the signs. Um, you know, one way that the signs would be would be uh, weather prognostication. If you look at the book of Job, it has some um, uh, some discussion of heavenly bodies. It mentions Orion and the Pleiades and the chambers of the south. It mentions the, the bear and so forth. And I didn't notice this for a long time until I got pointed out to me by a, a commentary I was reading or a book I was reading. And it's true. It's actually buried in, in, a, in a rather lengthy section there dealing with things dealing with astronom I mean, with uh, meteorological things going on. And it kind of reads like a, a farmer's almanac in that respect. Turns out people have used this. The appearance of the Pleiades in the sky would tell people uh, what was, what time of year it was, what, how the weather was going to change. So people have noticed these changes in the sky. Uh, in ancient Egypt, the flooding of the Nile was a very important time. And, uh, they noticed that it coincided with what's called the uh, heliacal rising of the star Sirius. Uh, Sirius is called the dog star because it's in the constellation of the big dog. And so uh, they begin to call this the middle of summer, uh, height of summer there in ancient Egypt, when they're getting ready for the uh, flag of the Nile and get ready for crop planting. Uh, they call these dog days, a term we still use today. So, uh, Astronomical things can be used for weather weather forecasting. You know, Jesus chided the uh, Pharisees for you know using the uh, their version of uh, red sky at night, sailors delight, sailor red sky in morning, sailor take warning. Said so you look at these signs in the sky, you could tell it's going to rain tomorrow, but you aren't even aware of the signs of the times. These were heavenly signs too. But then I think something like the Magi that says in Matthew two that they uh, they had a star that they saw in the east and. When they got to Jerusalem, they asked for directions where this king was going to be born. They knew from the sign in the heavens. And then they found out they had to go down to Bethlehem. And when they did, they traveled the six miles or so from Bethlehem, uh, Jerusalem down to Bethlehem. They rejoiced. They saw the star again. They hadn't seen it apparently for some time. And people have tried to, and that, that's, that's, a, that's an example of a sign, I think, being used as well in, in pattern with, in co coincidence with the, one of the uh, sign, sign being one of the, uh, purposes of the heavenly bodies. Now, many people try to explain this in terms of natural phenomena, a comet or a supernova or planet alignments and so forth. But I spent a lot of time looking at this, and I am not convinced that any of the naturalistic explanations really fit Matthew's description at all. The things seemed to go before them uh, as they left Jerusalem. And then when it got to the place where the child was, it was directly over that place. Now, was it a particular house or was it just the whole little town? Well, it doesn't matter a whole lot because Bethlehem was a pretty small town anyway. And uh, the idea that, well, they just happened to, to, the Magi just happened to see the star over top of the house of the town and said, well, what's over where it's supposed to be. That's insulting to the Magi. The Magi were actually gifted astronomers. They knew the skies very well. And they knew if this were just a, a parallax effect, if they went you know, a couple hundred feet off to the side, it wouldn't be over that point anymore. I think what happened is that they would have walked around the house, the thing would have moved with them and stayed over there. So many of us have concluded that uh, this star probably was a specially made thing that may have been geographically localized so that only a few people, such as the Magi, saw it. And we talked before about what the uh, stars were in the ancient context. And uh, Stars are just light in the sky. Well, if you go out at night and you see an airplane, 
you're seeing a star under that definition. Uh, if you if you take a time machine and take a plane back to thousands of years ago and flew it around and now with your lights on, people say, look at that star, what's it doing? It's making a funny noise. So I think this thing was like a, like a, like a drone something that God made and it was flying around and, and producing light, doing exactly what God designed it to do and nothing more. And uh, so it was a temporary thing, it was a special thing. And I know it's not as exciting perhaps as, you know, confirmation coming from science, but we don't need confirmation from science, do we? We know there was a star because mm-hmm. Matthew's gospel tells us that there was. So you, you so, uh, I, I didn't quite catch that. Sorry, it's a bit echoey. Bethlehem no longer exists, basically. Yeah, that'd be my argument that it no longer exists. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, well, we've been going just over an hour, so um, we've sort of come to the end of things. But if anyone has a question that they quickly want to type out, and we can get that to Danny. Um, do you have your books again, Danny? We can quickly show those to people. Yeah, okay. just to remind, that's The Created Cosmos, and Danny has written another book, The Expanse of Heaven. These are two great books that will really help you um, with the biblical text and what the Bible tells us about the cosmos. And again, we have a 20% discount on resources. So Danny, Danny's modeling them there on the screen. And so- uh, Let me say what the books are real quickly. The, um, the first one I wrote about four years ago now, The Creative Cosmos, uh, this is about, uh, uh, about biblical astronomy, all the things that God, the Bible says and doesn't say about astron- astronomical things. When I got finished with the book, I realized I had had to write another book because I didn't deal with the creation science of astronomy very much. So that's what caused me to make the, the, the creative cosmos. And the two kind of make a match set. They're the same size, same shape, and they kind of go together uh, with one another. And so if you want to know about, you know, all the creation scientists are saying and thinking about astronomy, uh, the two together will probably answer most of those questions for you. Yeah. We did have a question coming earlier that I missed. Um, someone asked, um, why is it possible to see so clear the moon and its texture using a normal photographic camera with a good zoom if it's around 400,000 kilometers distant from the Earth? Well, you, when, you, when you take a zoom, you're magnifying the image uh, quite a bit. And you've got to keep in mind that the, the moon is uh, over a little over 2,000 miles across. That's like, what, uh, 3,500 kilometers or so. It's a big mm-hmm. object, bigger than you think. It's as big as the United States is across. And so uh, whenever you zoom it in, either with a mag- magnifier on it, put on an eyepiece, put on a telescope, or if you use, a, a lot of people are using what they call the P900 or P1000 camera with this huge uh, zoom on it. It's a part optical and part digital zoom, but you're making the image look larger. Uh, the reason why your eye can't uh, see great detail in the moon is because your eye is limited to about um, one arc minute of resolution, and the moon is about 1,800 arc minutes across. So you're just seeing some of the grosser features. You can't see individual craters, for instance. You can see those light and dark areas in the moon I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, called the dark area is called the Maria. But when you zoom in on it, um, you've got a bigger lens in your eye too, by the way. The camera lens is larger than your eye is and you're simply zooming it and magnifying it. Now there's a limit to how high you can go. If you keep magnifying and magnifying, it starts to get blurry after a while, and that's because of resolution's not there. But these, have, these cameras have very good lenses on them, and they have the ability to, to zoom them up quite a bit. And so there's no limit to how far you can see. If you try looking at things that are far away on the Earth, as long as you have gear, good, clear sky, you can uh, air between not a lot of turbulence. You can see quite a bit of detail on distant objects on the Earth. Try it. I mean, it's, it's not surprising we can see detail on the moon. Still, uh, with those zooms, you're not going to see a crater any smaller than a few miles across. It's, um, yeah. Those craters may look tiny to you, but they're actually quite large. The craters you're probably going to see are probably 8, 10, 15, 20 miles across that you're looking at. Yeah. Thanks. I, ho- I hope that helped the person who asked the question. 